So we're in Acts 4. Um, as you guys know, we've been in Acts 4. I've been preaching Acts 4, 1 through 22 for a good few weeks now. And we're going to concentrate on verses 5 through 13 this morning, and I promise we'll finish this section this morning. Um, and so we're going to be in Acts 4 um, together, starting in verse 5. We'll read that together in just a minute. But I want to tell you, so um, just something that came to mind as I was studying and learning um, this passage and preparing to speak this morning um, reminded me of a time I was, when I was in high school. Uh, many of you guys had jobs in high school. How many of you worked when you were a kid? Yeah, that's the way to do it. So I worked, um, the first place I ever worked was Max Barbecue in Skytook. And by the way, if you've not eaten Max Barbecue in Skytook, you've not eaten barbecue yet. I'm just telling you it's true. Those little hole-in-the-wall places are always the best ones, and so it was so good. Um, but that's where I, I worked when I was in high school. It was my first real job, and uh, it was interesting. So what I would do is as soon as I'd get out of basketball practice or weightlifting or golf or whatever it would be um, a day at school, um, when I was working, I'd go from school, change clothes, head into work. And uh, it, was a, it was a pretty typical job you'd expect at a restaurant like this, right? And so like um, I'd get in and we'd take the meat out. I'd season meat, get it onto the smoker. I'd take, we had this giant smoker in the back. It was huge. It's running 24-7 and um, a lot of the meats are smoked for 12, 15, 16 hours a day, and so I'd go take them off when they're done and prep them. Then I'd get to help with prepping the food, um, getting the plates ready. I'd, I'd clean and mop and do, do all the stuff that you'd expect at a job, pretty typical job like that. But um, I'd get off work, and then I'd head home. And it's interesting, um, even though I didn't work every day and I was out and about all the time, whenever I got home, my family knew if I had just been at work. And it wasn't because of the clothes I was wearing. We wore new, more normal clothes. But if any of you have had a job like that, have been around a place like that, you know what I'm talking about. I smelled exactly like that smoker. You ever, it's like a campfire. You guys go to a campfire and then you smell like smoke for the rest of the day and maybe the next couple days. And so that, that camp barbecue smoker smell was nearly impossible to get off. Man, there were times I'd like shower and change and go out with my friends after and they still could smell that I had been at work that day. Um, I, I personally thought it was a pretty good smell, but I don't think that's what my friends were wanting to smell literally every time they were around me all day. Um, but but I, you couldn't get it off. They knew. They knew I had been at work. And have, have you guys ever had a job like that or really had anything like that? Maybe it wasn't the smoker smell like a campfire. Maybe um, you've got a, a friend or a family member who you spend time around and they've got the same like cologne that they're always wearing so much of that when you leave, you, you smell like them too. You, you got that? Um, maybe it's not even a smell. Maybe it's just something they can notice in you. Um, like you imagine like that guy you've got a crush on in high school and you get to spend some time with him. And then when you walk back to your friends, you got this big old giant smile on your face that your friends know that you just spent time with this guy, right? They can just tell where you have been. Well, we see something just like this idea in Acts 4. We see this. See, part of the passage that's easy to miss is actually one of my favorite parts of this passage in Acts 4. Because do you remember what, we, what we've been studying, right? You remember what we saw here? Peter and John, they got arrested for preaching the gospel, and then they were freed, and they were told, don't do it anymore. And they're like, listen, I'm going to do this. <laughs> so whether it's right by you, you got to deal with it. But for me, I'm going to do this. And so we see this happening, but I want you to, to pay special attention to what I'm talking about here. And, and turn with me to Acts 4. We're going to read um, just verses 5 through 13 this morning. Just verses 5 through 13, but pay attention to this idea as we see the life of Peter and John and something that's noticed in them. It's going to take me a while to get there. There we go. Acts 4, starting in verse 5. If you can and if you will, will you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word together this morning? Starting in verse 5, it says, On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Remember, they're talking about the healing of the crippled man. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. 
For there is no other name under heaven among, given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Will you pray with me? Lord, I pray this morning that we would understand what's happening here in this passage. And from this place, we would live our life in a way that people would recognize that we have been with you. Change us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can grab a seat. Did you guys catch that? I tried to make it abundantly clear. The leaders recognized that Peter and John had been with Jesus. They'd been with Jesus. What do you think it was about Peter and John that they recognized, right? What do you think that was going on um, that they had been with Jesus? How, how would they know that? You know, when I was first just kind of positing this idea, I thought, man, they've been living the life for a while of like homeless traveling evangelists. And so like maybe there's that um, I haven't showered in three weeks kind of smell that they're giving off. And they're like, yeah, I think they've been with that Jesus guy. No, that's probably not it. Probably not. Here's what I think we see from the text, right? So let's dive into this text, and you're going to see a few things. And the first thing that they clearly mention in here was their boldness, right? Do you see that? Say, when they, in verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were bold. We talked the, the last few weeks about the perspective they had. Um, and the perspective they had was being willing to share the gospel in the face of persecution and the fact that the leaders were telling them not to do it. They still said, this is what we're going to do, right? And so they knew their call to spread the gospel from Jesus was worth it. And so knowing God called them to do it, knowing the importance of their message, Peter and John were bold. And that boldness stood out from people around them. And I think that tells us very clearly we should be bold in telling the world about Jesus because the gospel of Christ is the most important message in the world. In verse 13, which is one of my favorite verses here in Acts, right, it says they, they, they saw that they were common, uneducated men, and they were astonished, and they recognized they had been with Jesus because of this, right? They say Jesus is the cornerstone. Do you see that just before then? Jesus is the cornerstone. I got to tell you, as a pastor, I'm called to teach people to know and follow Christ, right? And then I'm going to teach them to then do the same thing, to help others to know and follow Christ. We call that disciple making. We're not meant to just be disciples. We're called to make disciples, right? And so there's so many truths in Scripture that, that are important to teach someone in this process, right, of knowing Christ, of following Christ, of being a disciple, of making disciples. There's so much truth in Scripture, but it all starts with the gospel. And so it says this because when building here, and this time when building, and, and maybe this is the same these days as well, there's the cornerstone, and what they would do is they would set the cornerstone and that would tell them the lines and exactly how to build the rest of the building and to prepare the foundation. And so that cornerstone was vital because if the cornerstone was not set right, everything else that they would build would be off. So the cornerstone was really important for everything they were building. And that is the same truth in Christianity with the gospel. You must know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because if you get that wrong, everything else that you're going to teach and that you're going to do will inevitably, inevitably be at least a little bit off. If you don't get the gospel right. And let me tell you, it's going to be significantly wrong. So the cornerstone of Christianity is the gospel message, Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done. And so let me lay out to you very clearly that message. You've probably heard it from this pulpit. Hopefully you've studied it in your life. But it is so vital to get correct. And it's talked here, right? You see in 11 and 12, Peter and John saying, There is no other name under heaven and much uh, among men than Jesus Christ. He is the one that we are saved by and through. And if you reject him, you've missed it. And so here is the truth. All people, you and I included, have sinned in our life, right? We messed up. The Bible calls it sin. It's a churchy word, but the truth is we did something wrong. And it's not that we did something wrong that the world thinks is wrong. Anything contrary to what God wants is wrong and therefore sin. If God wants you to do something and you don't, it's sin. If God wants you to not do something and you do it, it's sin. He is the bearer of truth and good. 
And so we've all done that. Not to get crazy, but the Bible talks about how in Adam, we were with Adam in the beginning, and so his sin is even imparted on us when we're born. We don't need to go into this because guess what? Even without that, we still all screw up. We are sinners. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, okay? And we talk about this. This isn't just like death. We're all going to die, probably. There's been a few people that didn't. But we're all probably going to die. But it's not talking about death there in Romans 6. It's saying death there is representing separation from God. The wages of sin is death. And so what it's saying is wages, what you deserve, what you rightfully have earned by sinning, by not listening to God, is separation from him. Eternal separation from God is what you deserved because of your sin. One thing. And that sounds crazy, but the truth is, God is the creator of all heaven and earth. He is the giver of all blessings. He is the creator of life and the giver of life. And so if we don't do what the person who gave us everything has called us to do, then we deserve separation. He gets to choose. And a rightful, just God cannot let that go. See, that's, that's the bad news part that comes before the gospel. Gospel means good news. And so that's the truth of everyone on earth at, the point, at some point in their life. They, they have sinned at all points in their life. And they're separated from God. Rightfully so. And see, this is bad news. Not just because all people who have sinned that are separate from God, that means that they are eternally destined for hell. Because God is eternally reigning in heaven. And if he is there and we have to be separate from him, when we die, there's only one other place to go. And so... So all people before Christ are eternally headed for hell because they have denied him, they have disobeyed him, and they are headed for eternity separate from him. But not only that, in their eternity afterlife, in their uh, their time on earth, they don't have relationship with him. They're separated from him. They can't be good if they want to. They can't overcome sin if they try because it takes God for that. And so these people, us, you and me, were this. We're separated from God because what we have done, we rejected God, we disobeyed him. Because God is just, a good judge punishes the guilty. But God is just and he is also good and he is loving. And you see, God knew at the point he created the universe, he knew that he would create you and he knew that you would disobey him. And he loved you so much, knowing that your choices would separate you from him and knowing that there's nothing you could do to overcome it. You see, a lot of people think, there's a lot of even religion that thinks we can be good enough. Like our works, we, we work our way to God. We can be good enough if we just go to church enough times or memorize enough Bible verses or, or help enough people or, or give to the needy or, or do these things. If we do enough works, good works, then we're going to somehow please God by our good works and he will save us because he's pleased with us. No, no. Your sin has separated you from God and there is no amount of good things that you can do to get back to God. You can't. It's a lie. But the good news is God knew that. And he knew that the the punishment, the payment needed for your sin was greater than you could pay, but he could. And that is why Jesus, Jesus, who is God, who was eternally in heaven, left perfect heaven and came to sinful earth, took on mankind's flesh. He lived a perfect life for over 30 years, and then he died on a cross. And we think that the death on the cross was bad, but we know when Jesus was, in, was praying and blood was sweating from him and he was crying, that it wasn't the pain of the cross, it wasn't the pain of the whips in his back that he feared, but he knew he was about to drink the cup of wrath, the payment, the punishment for all people, for all time. God's punishment for sin, Jesus took on the cross. It wasn't nails in his hands that made him cry. It was the punishment for our sin. And it was his love for us that made him willing to go there. Because there was nothing we could do. And he knew that. And he loved us so much. He said, even though you deserve death, Even though you are the one who messed up, I will take the punishment for you because I love you so much. 
And, and, and then you would think, okay, God, that's a great price to pay. So what do we then have to do to earn it? Again, nothing. Jesus offers salvation as a gift. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, which are two of my favorite passages in Scripture. It says, for grace you have been saved. Grace is unmerited favor. Getting something good you didn't deserve. By the way, mercy is not getting the bad thing that you did deserve. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves, but a gift of God. Gifts don't cost a thing. Not by works, so that no man can boast. There is nothing you have to do or you can do to get saved. You just trust in Jesus. You say, Jesus, I am separated from you. I know that I've messed up and, you, and that's separated me from you. But you, you Christ, you took my punishment for me that I couldn't take on my own. And I trust in you. That you are the creator. You are the savior. And it is in, it is in you I have faith for salvation. And you receive the gift of salvation. Now let me, let me finish the back end of this. When you receive that gift, it is yours. You receive eternal life. John three sixteen. You guys know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, not whoever does enough good and then, whoever believes in him shall not perish but has what life? Everlasting, eternal. Let me ask you, is it eternal life if you don't have it after a while? If you can lose it, did the life you have, was it eternal? then you can't lose your salvation because it's not in your hands and it's not up to your works. Remember Ephesians 2, John 3, 16. John 10, 27 through 30 says that God holds us in his hands. It is eternal life. And it's not because of you, it's because of the goodness of God. And so you can't lose it because you didn't earn it. God gave it to you. And he is so good you keep eternal life. Life. Not only do you receive eternal life, God himself, the Holy Spirit, he comes and indwells you and he sanctifies you and he, he makes you anew. You put on the new flesh, your new being, and now you have a chance to overcome sin and the Holy Spirit helps to fight your flesh, to help you to fight your flesh so that you can follow him. You can, you can know him. You have a shot. You have a hope that you've never had in your life. The gospel is a free gift because of the work Christ did for us when we couldn't earn it, when we didn't deserve it. And we receive it, and it is ours, because not because we are good, but because God is. That is good news, and that is the gospel. The rest of your walk with Christ, the rest of your life teaching and discipling, the rest of, of this, this side of eternity is based on you knowing that cornerstone of truth of who Jesus Christ is, and everything is built off of that. He is the firm foundation. Amen? So as it says, as Peter and John say to the religious leaders, under no other name are we saved than Jesus. We, if we are to boldly proclaim Jesus, if we are boldly proclaiming the gospel, the world will know that we've been with Jesus. Because we should be asking ourselves as we go through this passage, how is the world going to recognize I've spent time with him? If you boldly are proclaiming the gospel as Peter and John were here, the world will know you've been with Jesus. But here's an assumption. This is assuming you've spent time with Jesus. You see, Peter and John had, had spent time with Jesus they were literally with Jesus. They had seen the incredible things the Lord had done. And because of that, they couldn't help but tell people about it. That's, that's what they say here in verses 1 through 22. We can't help but tell everybody what we've seen and heard. Let me ask you a question. Can you help but tell people about Jesus all the time? Because when I read this passage, it makes me take a big bite of some humble pie, right? Because if I'm honest, I can. I can help but not tell people about Jesus all the time in my life. If you aren't overcome with the desire to tell people about Jesus and help them know him, then maybe we haven't really seen him work. And maybe we really haven't learned about him the way we should. 
And let's take that a step further, because we know that God is always working all around us, right? He is a sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, almighty God who's constantly working in and around us all the time. And so if he's working in us, if he's working through us, if he's working all around us, that means if we're not seeing God work, that means we aren't spending time with him like we should. Because if you're spending time with God, you will see that God is at work all the time. And so one reason why people may not notice that we're spending time with Jesus is because we aren't. Ouch. Now I'm not trying to beat us up, but there's a, there's, there's a truth here that we have to grasp which is that we need to be spending time with our Lord regularly. And then living the life that will come from an intimate relationship with Christ is one that the world will notice as different. They'll probably hate you for it, but they're going to notice it. But sometimes we're we're just not really spending time with the Lord. And here's the thing. You may be thinking, but Pastor... I, re- I, I have a Bible study time that I do regularly in my life. I'm reading my Bible regularly, but I don't really have that overwhelming desire that you're talking about to always be sharing Jesus all the time. But, but I am. I'm, I'm reading my Bible all the time. And this is where I want to draw an important distinction. Spending time with God will always lead you into His Word. Spending time in His Word. But hear me. Just because you're reading your Bible doesn't mean you're actually spending time with God. Okay? Lost people can read that Bible. Christians can read that Bible devoid of Christ's relationship. And I can tell you, honestly, this is something that I struggle with sometimes. See, especially, I'm, I'm uniquely blessed in this building, Jared and I, part of our job, a major part of our job is spending time with God, reading his word, learning about him, and, and teaching others, right? That, that's incredible. You guys have it harder than we do. We get to do this for a living, but many times when I'm studying my Bible, I've found that I'm not actually spending time with God. Here's one of the things that I mean. Sometimes I'm just reading my Bible academically, right? I'm studying it like a school book, It's got a lot of good information in it. It does have like tons of good information in it. And so I'm studying it like you would a school book. There's information I'm trying to find. I go and find that information because there's just a lot of truth here. It's full of it. It's literally all it is. But but I could fool myself into thinking that when I'm just academically looking for information in scriptures, that in that I'm actually spending time with God and I'm not. No, I'm, I'm reading the truth that he has given me, but I'm not spending time with him. Another thing that I am am guilty of doing, and and maybe you're with me here, is that I'll read my Bible, (coughs) excuse me, to check the box that I did my Bible reading today. Don't have to raise your hand. But you ever been there? It's like, I know I'm supposed to read my Bible. And so, man, I open it up, I read this section, boom, check the box. I read my, I did my Bible study for today, but I'm not seeking the Lord in this. I'm not speaking with him. I'm not listening. I'm just crossing, crossing it off my to-do list like a good Christian boy would, right? Here's the thing, reading the Bible. When we read the Bible to spend time with God, it looks different. And so I'm going to give you some quick helpful pointers. First, when studying the Word, when reading the Bible, start by praying. Start with prayer. Pray that God would speak to you through His Word. Maybe even ask God some questions and be intentional with the Lord and with that time and be clear. And then go to the Word with purpose. Study to know more about God. Study to know more about His character. See who He is and how He works in the world and the lives of the people through Scripture. And be mindful of For God to use his word to respond to your prayer. To what you're going through, to what you're asking about. Be mindful as you study the word for God to use that to speak to you. Sometimes a passage or a story is going to really stand out to you. You're going to see it in a different way than you ever have. Sometimes he's going to remind you of something or or remind you of, of who he is. And it's going to speak to what you've been seeking. And then seek to apply those truths to your life. Close in prayer as well. Ask God to continue to show you his will through through your day. Ask him for the strength and the boldness to live every moment for him every day. Thank God 
for all the incredible things he's done. And here's a, here's a great tip for you. Be specific in your thanksgivings to God. Thank you, God, because you are good. Yes. Thank you, God, that when I woke up this morning, I, I was rested. You gave me rest. Thank you for the family that I have. God, I, I wouldn't have them without you. Thank you. Because my friend was, was worried about cancer. And it came back none. God, thank you for my job that I can provide for my family. Thank you for the time I have to spend with you this morning. Be specific. Because what that's going to do is that's going to that's create in you uh, an in intentionality throughout your day to seek God's goodness, to recognize him for it. And here's a beautiful thing to do, right? The Bible says pray continually. That's not saying, did you know you, you don't have to close your eyes to pray? Nothing in scripture that says you close your eyes. Now it's good because it helps you not be distracted, but like when you're going through your day, recognize the goodness of God and thank him for it. Recognize opportunities and ask him for help throughout your day. And look for God to move. See him in every day and pray throughout your day. That is spending time with God, and that is spending time with God through his word. Consider this with me for a moment. You wake up. You start your day with time before God, right? Before you get out of bed, you say a little prayer. Then in your morning routine, you get your daily quiet time. You pray and ask God to speak to you and show you his will for your day and, and to give you boldness. And, it, and in your time studying the word, you're reminded of the grace and mercy of God that he showed on the cross. You're struck by how the gospel is truly the salvation message for every lost person in the earth. And you're reminded how vital it is that the world knows the truth and sees the love of God. You close in prayer, thanking God for his goodness and asking for boldness to show the love of Christ throughout your day. You ask that he would bring someone into your past that needs to know him so that you can show the love of Christ to them. And then you head on to work. And guess what? On the drive-in, someone immediately cuts you off in the middle of traffic. And you have to slam on your brakes to keep from hitting them. So you pull around them and you have an option. Knowing that you just passed them and they cut you off and you almost got in a wreck, you have an opportunity to throw up some sign language. But instead you smile and you wave. Because you're reminded how much God forgave you on the cross from this morning. That's what's fresh on your mind. And so the idea that someone would cut you off and craft traffic is nothing compared to what you did and what you deserved. So you move on. Then you get to the office and the person in the cubicle next to you starts telling you about the crappy weekend that they have and how terrible they're dealing with problems with their wife. And again, you have some options. You could, you could give a, yeah, brother, man, sometimes women are the worst, right? They just don't get it. Or maybe you just sit there quietly and ignore them and wish that he would shut up because you've got work to do and you don't want to hear about his problems. But you don't. You see, you asked God this morning for opportunities like this. So you invite them to dinner with you and your wife. And you let them know that, you know what, we've been through tough times. And to be honest, when I was in those tough times, you tell them, the small group in my church really stood with me. They really helped me out. So you invite them to that too. Afterwards, you thank God for answering your prayer and giving you the opportunity that he laid before you. You see, when you've spent time with God, when you're seeking his will throughout your day, you act differently and the world will notice. John 13, 35 says that the world will know that we are disciples of Christ by our love for one another. If you truly love someone, you want them to know and follow Christ. That's what's best for them, right? It's not always what they want. My kids want mac and cheese and ice cream for every meal, right? I kind of want mac and cheese and ice cream for every meal too, I'm not going to lie. That's what they want. My wife loves my kids. And so you know what my wife does? She feeds them something different. She prepares, prepares healthy and delicious meals for them that are best for them. Because loving someone is desiring what's best for them. It's not giving them whatever they want all the, mo all the time or any given moment. If we love the world and if we're spending time with Christ, we can't help but tell them about Jesus. He's done so much for us. Here's what I want you to do. 
Take a moment to reflect on your life and be reminded of how good God's taking care of you. Every moment you have is from him. If I'm paying attention, I'm going to see that he's the reason for every good thing in my life, and he's the answer to all of my problems. We should want to share that with others, especially if we know that God is exactly what they need. You see, when we live like that, people will notice. Because we're not giving off the aroma of the the smoked up grill in a barbecue place. We're giving off the aroma of Christ to everyone around us. People will notice when we've been with him. So we must ask ourselves humbly and seriously, intentionally, that's my word this year, do people notice that I've spent time with Christ? And if not, why not? I'm going to pray in just a moment. I think Adriana and JP are going to come up and and do a little uh, praise music with us. In this time, I want you to just be reminded of how good God is. I can't tell y'all. Like people look at me and think, okay, look, you're educated, you're a hardworking guy. You must, you got things going on good in your life because you're doing so good, right? Because you, hmm, nothing. Nothing good in my life is because of me. There's no amount of education that's going to get me closer to God. There's no amount of hard work that's going to get me closer to God. It's, it's intentional relationship with him, spending time with him, and realizing everything good is from him. And so JP, or JP and um, Adriana, come on up. As they play, I want to invite you to reflect on the goodness of God and to ask him to help you spend time with him. As crazy as that sounds, he's so good, he's going to do that. And commit to the Lord to be faithful and committed and intentional with him. And then watch what God's going to do. Watch him move. Watch him give you opportunities. And then thank him in that time. Will you pray with me?